Great, thank you. As you've heard, the topic of our discussion this afternoon is achieving HIV control. And it's very interesting, as you heard Linda Gale, who really knows what she's talking about, go through a very convoluted way to describe what HIV control is, which is really important because there are definitions that come from different areas. One of the ones she mentioned uh, is, I'm going to get to in, in a second, but I think before we talk about control, we need to find out what the object is, what the target of our control is. And this is a slide that I think everybody in the room is very familiar with. It's the later, latest UN AIDS global update that we have 38 million people living with HIV, but the important number on the slide is the 1.7 million new infections. Because when you talk about control, you talk about incidence. Now the paper that Linda Gale mentioned is a paper that recently came out in Lancet which gave as one of the possible definitions of HIV control as an incidence less than one in 10,000 people per year. And having looked at all of these definitions, I thought it would be maybe important for the audience to know what is not control. So when you look at infectious diseases, you talk about three ways of addressing them. You either control them, you eliminate them, or you eradicate them. And so, HIV control is an incidence, whatever number we choose or the model chooses, that's stable and a relatively low level. What it isn't is elimination. And I think that's what people sometimes get confused that we're going to eliminate. Ultimately, after you control it, you'd love to eliminate it. And then there's eradication. That's, I think, too aspirational for HIV. We've only eradicated one human disease, smallpox, and one animal disease, Rinderpec. So let's talk about what is feasible for us. For me, HIV control, whatever the number is, means you've ended the HIV pandemic as an epidemiological state. And we can figure out later what that all means. So in ending the epidemic, and we'll get a chance to discuss this during the question period, there are two major buckets of how you do that. One is the non-vaccine prevention. And non-vaccine prevention has many, many modalities that generally are used in combination because there's no one single one that in and of itself would do the trick. But one really does stand out as having been over the last several years a true game changer. And that is treatment as prevention. But when you think of treatment, you have to look at it in two ways. The treatment that benefits the individual. In other words, saving the life of an individual by bringing down the level of virus to below detectable. And there are a number of studies, many of which were sponsored by the NIH, the SMART study, the START study, which clearly show that early treatment to bring down the level of virus is the way that you definitely benefit the individual. The benefit is shown in actuarial life curves. As um, Bill mentioned that many of us have been involved in this, the first patient that I took care of with HIV was an individual in the fall of 1981 when the disease didn't have a name, it didn't have an etiology, and it certainly didn't have a treatment. And at that time, since patients presented with advanced disease, the uh, projected life expectancy was about 12 months. Now today, if you look at an individual who comes in in their 20s, who's early infected and you put on a triple combination, you could project to them that they would live an additional 50 plus years, which if you do the actuarial counts with the life expectancy in a developed world, that's a little bit less than the average life expectancy, as you might expect because of comorbidities. Now you put that aside, there's the treatment benefits for the community, and that's going to be critical for controlling the epidemic. We know through the now famous HPTN 052 study that the treatment benefits for the community are enormous because there are no linked transmissions when HIV was stably suppressed by ART. As I mentioned in a talk earlier today, these results are so impressive that we almost didn't believe them when they first came out. So we made a major investment to do a number of studies, predominantly in gay men, 
partners in 2016, opposite of tracks in 2018, and partners two published in 2019, which showed that in over 150,000 condomless acts, there were no linked HIV transmissions when the partner who was infected was stably suppressed with art, which has now allowed us to say something that we've been dancing around with for a few years, but that we know now is absolutely scientifically correct, that undetectable truly does mean untransmittable. And that has enormous benefits for what we're talking about this afternoon. Superimpose upon that one of these many uh, modalities of prevention, which is pre-exposure prophylaxis, which, and I have to emphasize, with high adherence, because that's the challenge that all of us face, that there's greater than 95% efficacy in preventing the acquisition of HIV infection. And the results in the community are important. Because if you look at studies, for example, from England, if you look at the fall in new HIV diagnosis at the time that there was initiation of PrEP in individuals in sexual health clinics, the results are very clear. In Australia, the same thing. PrEP rollout was associated with a 25% reduction in HIV diagnosis associated with pre-exposure prophylaxis. Now, there has been a lot of talk about the four major studies that looked at treatment as prevention. And shown, interestingly, that even when you go out of your way into the community to get people on therapy, with one half of one study out of four, there was a drop, but a significant decrease in incidence. Now, does that tell you that treatment as prevention is not good? No. I, if you didn't have treatment as prevention, you would go nowhere. But what it strongly suggests to us that together with treatment as prevention, if you really want to reduce incidence, and get to one of my first slides, reduce incidence equals control of HIV, then you almost certainly have to have pre-exposure prophylaxis. So if you put those two together, the scientific basis for controlling HIV, among other things, firmly lies in the scientific accomplishment of treatment as prevention and pre-exposure prophylaxis. Now where is the challenge? It's the implementation of those scientific tools to end the pandemic. And that's really where we are right now in our attempts to control. Now, one of the things that might make it easy, because if you try and do it diffusely, there are probably not enough resources to do that. But if one focuses on hotspots, then you have an advantage. There are geographic hotspots. Some pretty good examples. For example, in KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa, if you look at this map, as in most of these heat maps, dark colors mean high numbers of people living with HIV. And as you geographically get away from KwaZulu-Natal, it gets less and less. The same thing is seen in Kenya, around the Lake Victoria area, where the dark coating of this heat map shows you the intensity of people living with HIV. And then there are demographic hotspots. Probably the most dramatic of that is what is seen in the KwaZulu-Natal area of South Africa. When, when you go into clinics that attend to pregnant women, the prevalence of HIV is stunning and is the major challenge to the control of HIV in that country. Now, some of you, maybe many of you, have heard of the plan in the United States of ending the epidemic for the United States. It is based on that premise, on concentrating on hotspots. In the United States, we have a very strong democratic vulner demographic vulnerability. 13% of the population is African American. 43% of all of our new infections are among African Americans, 60% among men who have sex with men, and 75% are under age 35. So if you look at where the epidemic is, it's among African American or Latino transgender men who have sex with men who are young. Now, that's not the only ones who are getting infected, but that's the great bulk of it. In addition, we found out something that when I first saw this, I had gone over this map very carefully with Bob Redfield, who's the director of the CDC, 
And we were scratching our heads because we almost couldn't believe it. If you look at these little squiggly boxes in the map of the United States, those are counties. There are 3,007 counties in the United States. More than 50% of all of the infections in the United States occur in 48 out of 3,007 counties, plus the District of Columbia, where I live, and San Juan, Puerto Rico. The blue shading of those seven southern states indicate an area where there's a lot of infection in rural areas outside of the city. Why is that important? It's important because the amount of stigma in those rural areas against men who have sex with men, particularly African-American men who have sex with men, is extraordinary. So the plan is simple. Diagnose to, by testing. Treat, prevent, and respond to outbreaks like we're seeing with our opioid crisis in the United States with a plan of decreasing by 75% by uh, five years and by 90% in 10 years so that it's aspirational, there's no guarantee we'll do it, but our approach to controlling the epidemic would be to do that. Finally, as I always say, if you really want to control it, even though we have the tools to implement, and then if we did, we'd have a great deal of an advance towards controlling, a vaccine is necessary for what I call, and listen, because people get confused, they say, well, wait a minute, you say you already have the tools to control it, then why do you need a vaccine? If you want global, complete, and durable control, you are going to need a vaccine because of all of the impediments of getting out and implementing. And in vaccine prevention, as I talked in some detail earlier today, is two major approaches. The first is an empiric approach with one success so far, the now famous RV144 trial with 31% efficacy. It's not ready for deployment, but it gave us a giant step towards trying to perfect what the correlative immunity is. And when you know what the correlative immunity is, which in this case is a non-neutralizing antibody against a component of the viral envelope, if you increase the strength, breadth, and durability by boosting different vectors, adjuvants, and even mosaic antigens, there are three studies, two that are ongoing, and one that will start later in the year that are going to use the model of a prime boost. And in some cases, a little bit different than the RV144, particularly with the quadrivalent AD26 mosaic prime. And in the Mosaico trial, a prime that's a mosaic and a boost that's mosaic. The other is to assume a correlate of immunity and to design a vaccine. We know the correlate we're looking for is a broadly neutralizing antibody. We already know that the body can make broadly neutralizing antibody, but they don't do it very well. But what the antibodies tell us is that it gives us a handle on the neutralizing epitopes. When you identify the neutralizing epitopes, you can try and turn it into an imidogen that would be a vaccine. And so in summary, what we're talking about this afternoon is that we have the HIV science to get to where we want to go and we need to implement it. If implemented properly, we will achieve HIV control, which is the subject of what we're talking about. And if we achieve HIV control, we will have ended the epidemic. Thank you.